Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to introduce the third panel, The Context and Beyond, in which we'll have these papers by these, um, by, by these five, four speakers. And the order that we'll go in is uh, uh, the first person to be speaking is uh, Andrew Whitehead. Andrew is, the, is an editor uh, of BBC World Service News. He's a former BBC Delhi correspondent. And uh, he's an, also an editor of the History Workshop Journal. He's the author of A Mission in Kashmir, not Mission Kashmir, the movie. He's the author of A Mission in Kashmir, published in Delhi by Viking Penguin in 2007, which talks about the opening stages of the Kashmir conflict in the autumn of 1947, based particularly on personal testimony. Uh, he also was uh, awarded recently a, a PhD uh, by published work from the University of Warwick, and he has written extensively about uh, Kashmir in the 1940s. Um, his oral history archive has over 200 interviews of those who have lived through the partition, which have been conducted in South Asia and, and beyond. Um, and that also includes images uh, of Kashmir in 1947. So Andrew is going to be our first speaker. Thanks, Natasha. Uh, everyone will be using PowerPoint, so they'll continue from here. I'm sure for many of us, um, Pavina Ahanka's words still linger, and I'd just like to say a personal thank you to you for talking to us today. I greatly appreciated it. Um, I'm a nightmare for conference organizers. Uh, I'm really sorry, Dibyesh. Um, I was invited in one guise to talk about one subject. I said I'd love to come, but I would like to talk about a completely different subject wearing a completely different hat. Um, I'm a journalist and a historian, but I'm not here as a journalist. I'm not speaking on behalf of the BBC. I'm speaking a little bit about the work I've done about Kashmir in the 1940s. But there are similarities. I became interested in Kashmir's history because I went to the valley as a journalist, particularly in the 1990s, which were very grim days. Uh, and both historians and journalists seek to interrogate established narratives. And that's what I'm going to try and do with some images there are three, arguably, nationalist narratives of Kashmir. There's the Indian nationalist narrative, which says they got Kashmir fair and square, and that all the opposition to Indian rule, whether armed or otherwise, is the work of Pakistan. There is the Pakistani nationalist narrative, which says um, that India got and holds Kashmir by force of arms, and that status is against the logic of partition, which is that all adjoining Muslim-majority areas become part of a new Muslim nation. And then there's the Kashmiri nationalist narrative, which basically says that Kashmiris have been deprived of agency over their own political dispensation by two powerful and feuding neighbours, and sometimes goes on to add that that feuding has uh, disrupted something very precious, which is often called Kashmiriate. The difficulty is all three of those nationalist narratives are in large part true, but they're also in even more part contradictory. If the Kashmir issue was simple, it wouldn't be so difficult to resolve. This road sign uh, is on the Jalan Valley Road as you enter Baramulla from the Srinagar side. Uh, it's usually, for fairly obvious reasons, guarded, and I suspect it probably isn't there at the moment. Um, it's the memorial to the first Indian troops who arrived in Kashmir um, on the 27th of October 1947. And about two miles away, uh, there is one of many cemeteries in uh, Kashmir. This is behind the convent hospital in Baramulla. And these are the graves of people who died on that same day, the 27th of October 1947, but not at the hands of the Indian army, but of an invading Lashkar, a tribal army from Pakistan, which invaded with the support of at least sections of the new Pakistan establishment. I found out about the story by chance from this woman, who is now buried in that same uh, convent hospital, Sister Emilia, who I first met in 1997, she was an Italian nun who'd been at Baramulla since 1933, and she'd lived through the attack on the convent, and she'd lived through the killing of one of her fellow nuns, a personal friend, a Spanish nun, at the hands of the Lashkar. And this was a, a way in to a very powerful story, a personal way in. It's ironic that the way in was through non-Kashmiris, but that's often the way that things are in Kashmir. 
and it gave me a way into personal testimonies of what happened in Kashmir in October and November 1947, when these guys invaded. These are Araksei tribesmen um, at, photographed in Rawalpindi on their way to Kashmir in early November 1947. Somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 uh, armed tribal fighters uh, came into Kashmir uh, at that time with uh, armed, at least in part, by the Pakistani army and with some Pakistani army officers uh, in civilian clothes accompanying them. Um, uh, what they got up to, in terms of personal testimony, is in part because uh, one of the people that they held hostage at the mission hospital in Baramulla was a correspondent for the Daily Express, which was then probably the world's biggest selling English language newspaper. And when he got out, he told his story of 10 days of terror. Um, the story is not simply about daring do and people um, holed up in a convent hospital. It's also about how the Lashkar failed to take Srinagar when initially there was virtually no military opposition and it's how they alienated support from local people. I also became increasingly interested by the images and iconography of Kashmir at this time. Um, and you, you sometimes think that you understand a story fairly well, and then something comes along and surprises you and realizes, makes you realize how little you know, know. So I was talking to a veteran Kashmiri communist in Delhi when he went away to his bedroom and took out of his Almira this remarkable pamphlet. Visually, it's one of the most arresting things I think I've ever seen as the front cover of a political pamphlet. Published in 1948 by the Kashmir Bureau of Information, in other words, broadly by the National Conference, um, and it shows women Kashmiris um, armed. The woman at the front is a representation of a woman called Zuni Gujri, who was a National Conference militant in Srinagar, and the photograph is of the Women's Self-Defense Corps, just about the only time when women were trained to use rifles and grenades on South Asian soil during that year of 1947. Um, even more arresting, and this is uh, a classic modernist leftist image designed by Sobha Singh, who was then part of the progressive arts movement um, and part of a remarkable concentration of progressive writers photographers, filmmakers, and playwrights which came to Kashmir in October and November 1947. And in terms of the iconography, there was something almost as startling. So this is the cover of the new Kashmir manifesto that the National Conference, the main Kashmiri nationalist party of the time, and still the governing party in Indian Kashmir, put out in 1944. That is Marianne. That is the emblem of the French Revolution uh, transposed to Kashmir. Even the, the National Conference flag, which is uh, a plough in white on a red background, when in 1946 a leading British communist, Rajani Palm Dutt, went by road from Raoul Pinder to Srinagar with a National Conference uh, flag flying from uh, the aerial of the car, he commented very proudly how similar it seemed to the hammer and sickle. And that was no accident. And of course, one of the first things that Sheikh Abdullah did when he came to power in Kashmir is he renamed the main square Lal Chok, Red Square. Where else is there a red square? The um, New Kashmir Manifesto, 1944, um, a quite remarkable document, um, not very widely read, but it bears reading. People know that it, uh, it put forward very far-reaching measures of land reform, which were eventually implemented. What they're less aware of, I think, is that it is explicitly pro-Soviet. It talks of the united, mighty Soviet state that is throwing back its barbarous invaders with deathless heroism. Its agenda included universal suffrage. It included equal pay for women. And, and this is 1944 in Kashmir, paid maternity leave. Um, and then you go on to have a look at the imagery of Kashmir in 1947, and you find this. Uh, this is um, a picture taken by Ramchand Mehta uh, of Mahatas, 
which was the great society photographer shop in Srinagar. It's still there on the Bund. I was there a couple of months ago. And this is Nehru, I suspect, in early November 1947, inspecting the women's militia in the central, uh, center of Srinagar. And you can see uh, Sulaimani Takta, Shankacharya Hill in the background. Um, it's a reminder of the complexity of Kashmir at that time, because, again, you do not expect to see photographs of Kashmiri women bearing rifles. Um, the National Conference at that time had a very active left-wing movement, uh, which uh, was very successful in mobilizing and which organized a militia which both Sheikh Abdullah and, indeed, as you can see, Nehru supported. In the People's Age, the main uh, Communist Party of India weekly journal at that time, two pages of photographs were devoted to this militia, and the text read, for the first time on the soil of India as they're being built an army of women trained to use the rifle and other modern weapons of war. The women of Kashmir are the first in India to build an army of women trained to use the rifle. By their example, they have made Indian history. They have filled our chests with pride. They have raised our country's banner higher among the great nations of the world. I've been trying to track down uh, veterans of the women's militia, and I've identified about eight or ten, and talked either directly or through a colleague to about four or five. And uh, most remain leftist by instinct, and they, are, they regard this moment as the defining political moment of their lives. They were given an agency as Kashmiri women in public life for a brief period in uh, the autumn of 1947, which they feel that they've never had again since. But there was a wider mobilization. Another picture by Ramchand Mehta from October, November 1947. This is the Bal Sena. This is the National Conference Children's Militia with the National Conference emblem on their hats parading and drilling with uh, wooden mock rifles in front of the Palladium uh, Theatre, which stands but in a greatly dilapidated state still in Lal Chowk. Um, and of course, there was a men's militia too. Um, much bigger men's militia, initially described as a peace brigade, uh, but they were part of what is sometimes forgotten, which is a mass mobilization on the streets of Srinagar in uh, the, the autumn of 1947. Um, the people's militia, this militia, unlike the women's detachment, saw active service. Several of their members were killed. Um, they were a pro-Sheikh Abdullah and a pro-India militia. Uh, they were anti-Maharaja, anti-Pakistan. And because it doesn't suit any of the three competing nationalist narratives to remember what they did and who they were, they have broadly been written out of the story. So what I'm trying to say is, and I'm saying it very briefly because I've only got a, a, a brief modicum of time, and I'm sorry that I haven't provided all the background that some of you might appreciate if you don't know a great deal about what happened in Kashmir at that time. But what I'm saying is that the Kashmir crisis as it began in 1947 is vastly more complicated with all sorts of different currents which you wouldn't understand by, any, by visiting any of the received narratives of what happened at that time. And I'm going to end on just two more photographs because I rather like them. Uh, this is, uh, these are the couple who are believed to have written the National Conference's manifesto. So the woman on the left is Frida Bedi, uh, born Frida Hulston, a woman from Derbyshire who moved out to Lahore initially with her husband, uh, BPL Baba Bedi, who was a, a leading communist and then moved to Kashmir and was a great ally of Sheikh Abdullah. She eventually became a Tibetan woman religious and was for a while the most senior non-Tibetan woman religious in Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, he eventually uh, turned to, his, uh, to Sikhism uh, for solace. But one final photograph. This is one of the most puzzling photographs I've ever come across. It's Sheikh Abdullah. He's clearly in a royal palace, and it's clearly a moment of transition because you've got all the portraits of the Kashmiri royal family 
off their hooks, and it almost feels that they're just about to be collected to be moved out or thrown out. Um, I can't find out anything more about this photograph, apart from I can tell you where I got it from, Omar Abdullah's Twitter feed. Um, uh, Omar Abdullah is Sheikh Abdullah's grandson, and he's the current chief minister of Indian Kashmir. He tweets uh, fanatically, and at one point uh, he tweeted... Uh, <laughs> I think that's a neutral term. Um, uh, and he, at one point he tweeted lots of images of Kashmir in the 1940s, of which this was one. And, of course, I messaged him back and said, tell me more. And, of course, I've heard nothing since. Um, but there is something quite remarkable about it, because this is a brilliant professional photograph. This is not a snap. And you wonder who took it. The composition, Sheikh Abdullah looking to the left, but on the left. Most people would have put him on the right looking to the left. And one thing that uh, intrigues me, and which I'm going to do more work on, if I can, Henri Cartier-Bresson, uh, the 20th century's most renowned news journalist in Kashmir in 47 48. Margaret Bourquite, one of the leading Western war photographers in Kashmir in 1947-48. Sunil Jana, uh, Madanjeet Singh, uh, pioneering Indian photographers. They were all there, partly because of the landscape, partly because of the story, but also partly because of their politics. Cartier Bresson, from a French communist background. Sunil Jana, Madanjeet Singh, taking photographs for the communist weekly paper, The People's Age. Margaret Bourke-White, distinctly progressive. Who did she lodge with when she was in Kashmir? Baba Bedi and Frida Bedi. So it all comes together. What do you take from that? I'll leave that for you to decide. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.